don't lie this has been a sort of theme of everything we've been talking about yeah, well tell telling the truth, the truth is hard because eh? yeah. you have to know the truth and that's hard but you can know when you're lying you sometimes you don't know because what the hell do you know but sometimes you know mm -hmm. and you can feel that that's a disjunction of meaning so you'll know you see this often with people who are very socially awkward you know They'll say something that's sort of grandiose and it really falls flat mm -hmm. and everyone's a bit embarrassed, <laughs> including them. It's like they've, if they were paying attention, they would notice that that disunited them and made them weak. And then they wouldn't say it. And so that's, that's the thing about not lying is that lies make you weak and you can feel it. It's, it's the antithesis of meaning. you breathe and I can feel a little piece of my soul dying but keeping it all underneath I feel like an April's fool even though it's meant to lie I'm gonna see you break that cool before you ever see me cry cause I got the tricks figured out Your spelling somehow you get your lines so blurred. I ain't buying what you're selling. And not since I figured out this is a wonderful and counterintuitive experiment which can be done with ordinary materials which are readily available in your house. You need a rubber tube, few balloons, a thread, clamp, and a pair of scissors. Seal one end of the rubber tube with clamp. Inflate a balloon and fix it to one end of the rubber tube with the help of a thread. Inflate another balloon to a smaller size and fix it to the other end of the tube. Make sure that there is no air leakage from the balloons. Now that the setup is ready, guess what will happen when we open the clamp? Most people think the air will flow from big balloon towards the small one and eventually both the balloons will be of the same size. Surprisingly, it's the opposite scenario. The air flows from small balloon towards the bigger balloon, expanding it even further. So, why does this happen? As you know, air always flows from higher pressure towards lower pressure, which means the smaller balloon has higher air pressure inside compared to the big one. This phenomena can be explained by Laplace equation. According to Laplace equation, there exists a pressure difference in curved surfaces. As the radius decreases, the pressure difference increases. That is, the radius of the curvature is inversely proportional to the pressure. Since the radius of the small balloon is less than the radius of the big one, it has greater curvature and hence more pressure in it. This explains why air flows from small balloon to big balloon. Now let's try this with two small balloons at one end of the rubber tube and a bigger balloon at the other end of the rubber tube. For this experiment, a Y-shaped joint is made on the rubber tube to which the two small balloons are attached. Upon opening, the air flows from smaller balloon towards the bigger balloon. Thank you. 
if you are more ambitious, you can try this experiment with two different size soap bubbles. Make a slant cut at one end of the straw and insert it to the other end. Now bend both the straw and make a U-shaped assembly. Make four petal-like cuts with the scissor on the open ends of the straw. Make a small hole and insert the used refill at the center of the assembly. Block one arm of the straw with fingertips and dip the other end in soap solution. Blow air to make a small bubble. Now close the other arm of the straw and blow air to make a bigger soap bubble. When we remove the fingertips, you observe a similar effect and the air in the smaller bubble will flow towards the bigger bubble. I hope you like this experiment and learn something new today. For more hands-on science experiments and DIY science craft, you can visit our YouTube channel which is Isar Pune Science Activity Center and subscribe to the same. Have fun!
Psychopathy infects the full spectrum of humanity, irrespective of race, culture, geography, economic class, or personality type. It is distributed in a population in a similar way that left-handedness is. One would not notice a person as left-handed until you see him write or catch a ball. Similarly, one may not notice a psychopath until you see him do something that requires them to have a conscience. Most people think of a psychopath as a rare creature found only in the lowest levels of society. However, the reverse is true. They are not rare, but actually quite common, and you are more likely to find psychopaths in the boardroom than on the wrong side of the tracks. The reason is that the more competitive a particular environment is, the more ruthless the use of the cheating strategy becomes. Within the highest circles of power and wealth, a lack of pity and remorse is practically a prerequisite to success, and only the psychopathic mentality can thrive. Because of the tremendous destruction psychopaths reap on society, it is vital for everyone to be aware of their existence and to recognize their behavior traits. Understanding them is the first step to defending against them. Key Characteristics Lack of Empathy Empathy is the ability to experience within oneself the feelings and emotions expressed by others. It is what allows us to feel what others are feeling. It is why we are inspired by works of art, music, and poetry. Empathy allows us to experience the grandeur of life, to be truly alive, and is one of the defining characteristics of what makes us human. Psychopaths have no empathy, and as a result, they are neither truly human nor truly alive. When they see normals, admiring a piece of art, or playing with their children, or caring for a pet, or any number of human emotional interactions, they cannot understand what all the fuss is about. Psychopaths realize at an early age that they are different, and that they should act as everyone else does, in order to be accepted into society. They learn to mimic what they see others do, but they can never understand why they should act this way. Although they are consummate actors, careful observation will reveal telltale cracks in their facade. They know enough to fake concern when someone is sick, or to pretend happiness when some good fortune befalls a friend. But in situations where the psychopath has no pre-rehearsed act, their ad lib often reveals a stunning lack of empathy. For example, if attending a funeral, a psychopath would correctly mimic the same expressions of sadness as the other mourners, but then makes sexual advances towards the grieving widow, clueless to the gross inappropriateness of such an action. People with empathy would instinctively understand such behavior as inappropriate. However, the psychopath cannot. Lack of remorse. Remorse is an emotional expression of personal regret felt by a person after he or she has committed an act which they deem to be shameful, hurtful, or violent. This very definition precludes a psychopath from experiencing such a feeling. With no empathy, there can be no emotional expression. Nor can a psychopath feel shame, nor comprehend that anything they do can be harmful to others. Psychopaths understand when people are angry with them for their behavior, and as a last resort, they may pretend they are sorry. But unlike most people, they are not the least bit disturbed by feelings of guilt. Remorse is a powerful negative emotion that causes turmoil in those that feel it. Turmoil that often results in self-destructive or self-deprecating behaviors. The psychopath may pretend remorse, but their real behavior is not changed. They still go shopping, they still go to parties, they have no problems sleeping at night. Superficiality Passion drives someone to go further than needed to explore, learn, and master a subject. Most people enjoy listening to music, but it is someone passionate about music that goes on to learn how to play an instrument. Similarly, many people are interested in new technology, 
but only a passionate person goes on to become an engineer. Lacking passion for anything other than themselves, psychopaths can never penetrate beyond the surface of most knowledge. As a result, they exhibit a superficial comprehension of some or many subjects, but are often seen by true experts as being shallow. Their superficiality extends to their attempts at acting normal by exhibiting false emotions through an exaggerated effect. Grandiosity Despite being shallow and superficial, psychopaths show no self-esteem issues. Psychopaths live in a falsely constructed worldview in which they are both literally and figuratively God. Often seen as megalomaniacs, they also have an equally overblown sense of entitlement. Irresponsibility Psychopaths are irresponsible because nothing is ever their fault. Someone else, or the world at large, is always to blame for all of their problems. This makes sense if you understand that psychopaths think themselves perfect. Nothing wrong can ever originate with them, and so logic, the psychopath's logic, dictates that everything bad is always someone else's fault. Impulsive Behavior The psychopath's impulsive behavior makes sense in light of their megalomania. In their world, whatever they want now is good, and whatever they do not want is bad. If a psychopath wants sex and his date will not provide it, then rape is good and the date is bad. If someone has money in his or her pocket and the psychopath wants it, then robbery is good and the victim is bad for possessing something the psychopath wanted. If this strikes the reader as insane, it is. One of the earliest writers on the subject of psychopathy, J.C. Pritchard, coined the now-defunct term moral insanity as a way to describe psychopathy in 1835. Compulsive Lying Living at the expense of the rest of humanity would be an impossible situation in a rational society. Psychopaths have solved this dilemma through their premier weapon, lies. Lies hold together their view of themselves, their own private universe, and facilitate their need to live parasitically off the rest of society. Without empathy, shame, and remorse, they are free to lie as often and as outrageously as they please. Normal people would blush or sweat or tremble if they dared stretch the truth to the same degree. However, for the psychopath, lying is as easy and natural as breathing. This is why they often pass polygraphs. They do not register the physiological reactions that non-psychopaths would when lying. They are so good at lying they can fool trained psychiatrists and even other psychopaths. What is important to know is that, given the right circumstances, they can fool anyone. Manipulative Hand in hand with the psychopath's extraordinary ability to lie comes the ability to manipulate others for their own benefit. Having spent their lifetime studying us, psychopaths are masters of manipulation and experts on knowing how to push our buttons to use our emotions against us. They use this ability to keep those around them confused, unable to think clearly, and off balance. Psychopaths also learn very early how their personalities can have traumatizing effects on the personalities of non-psychopaths, and how to take advantage of this for the purpose of achieving their goals. Like an electric eel that stuns its prey with an electroshock, Psychopaths in human personality and uncanny ability to manipulate can psychologically stun their intended victims. Antisocial Behavior The very essence of the psychopath is antisocial. Their lack of empathy for other people extends onto society and the environment. Vandalism, pollution, graffiti animal abuse, environmental destruction, building code violations, reckless driving, and a host of morally and socially unacceptable activities are of no concern to the psychopath. 
These, then, are the basic characteristics that psychopaths exhibit. Bear in mind that few psychopaths will express all of the characteristics and that non-psychopaths can have many of these characteristics as well. Common Types of Psychopaths While there are as many variations in the personalities of psychopaths as there are among normal people, the following lists some general stereotypes. Narcissists the most benign form of psychopathology is pathological narcissism. Narcissists, like the mythological Greek namesake Narcissus, are so overcome with self-love that nothing else in the world matters to them. They need a constant source of narcissistic supply, which is attention, adoration, recognition, awards, and praise. There are two basic types of narcissist the somatic and the cerebral. Somatic narcissists take pride in their looks and appearance. They will flaunt their sexual exploits, brag of their accomplishments, show off their muscles, and display their toys. They are often health nuts, hypochondriacs, and sex addicts. Because of their barren inner life, they continually need new thrills simply for the rush of adrenaline. These thrills range from criminal activity and substance abuse to increasingly bizarre sexual acts. Cerebral narcissists love their own minds. They are arrogant, condescending, and know-it-alls that pride themselves on being smarter than everyone else. Their narcissistic supply comes from fame, notoriety, awards, and displays of wealth to create envy in others. The danger to the public from narcissists is to drain on energy, time, resources, and emotional well-being. A narcissist is interested in a person only for what narcissistic supply that person can provide. They will gladly accept love, attention, affection, adoration, praise, emotional and financial support, but being without empathy, they cannot reciprocate any of it. Any partnership they enter into will always be one-sided. Once a person ceases to be the source of narcissistic supply, or a better source comes along, they are discarded without hesitation or consideration. Thus do narcissists leave behind them a trail of broken hearts, broken dreams, empty wallets, and abandoned children. The Victim Commonly used by female psychopaths, but by no means unheard of among males, is the professional victim stereotype. Preying on what psychopaths see as weakness in others, sympathy, the female psychopath appears helpless, pitiful, emotionally fragile, persecuted, and sexually vulnerable. She pretends heartfelt gratitude for whatever small kindnesses strangers provide her. But behind the mask is a cunning, ruthless, and loveless predator. Often using sex as the hook, they can juggle several victims at a time, draining them of life and money until there is nothing left, then skipping town to avoid the repercussions. Con Artists Not all con artists are psychopaths, but psychopaths make convincing con artists. Being excellent liars... They put that talent to use by cheating others. Without a conscience or remorse to stand in the way, they are free to cheat old women out of their life savings, sell quack cures to terminally ill patients, or shortchange the blind. They are usually charming, articulate, and convincing, and make successful salespersons. Unlike the narcissist, the con artist is not as concerned about love or attention as money. There are two types of cons psychopaths engage in, the short con and the big store con. The short con is probably the one that most often comes to mind when thinking about con artists. These are the tricks and cheats that require no great intelligence to pull off, such as shortchanging, bait and switch, and a three-card monte, to name a few. Psychopaths that have a higher intelligence level and or 
come from a more respectable background are more likely to establish the big store con. These are large-scale frauds that all rely on a basic strategy. Take something of little to no value, artificially inflate that perceived value, sell to gullible investors, take the money and run. Traditional big store cons use real estate, stocks and bonds as the lure. Even reputable multinational corporations, accounting firms and banks are all capable of being nothing more than a large-scale con. While the short con can deprive a victim of a few to a few thousand dollars, the big store cons are especially destructive, capable of destroying an entire nation's economy. Malevolent Psychopaths More popularly known as antisocial personality disorder or sociopaths, the malevolent psychopath is the real-life monster of our nightmares. These are the wife-beaters, murderers, serial killers, stalkers, rapists, sadists, pedophiles, gangsters, interrogators, and terrorists. They are usually career criminals and can amass an extensive criminal record while still in their early teens. Often showing their contempt with a sneer or smirk and with a vacant stare from cold predatory eyes, they are dangerous, unpredictable, and easily triggered into violence. Cowardly and sadistic, they tend to target the most vulnerable in society, women, children, and the elderly and disabled. Often impulsive and opportunistic, sociopaths will not hesitate to commit any type of crime and will use manipulation, intimidation, and violence to get what they want. Professional Psychopaths The malevolent psychopath is the most dangerous. However, it is the professional psychopath that is the most destructive. While the victims of the former can range into the dozens, the victims of the professional psychopath can run into the tens of millions. These psychopaths litter history with genocides and the destruction of entire nations and empires. Historical examples include such monsters as Stalin, Pol Pot, Ivan the Terrible, and Caligula. While there are many that make it to the pinnacle of the political stage, there are also such historical figures as J.P. Morgan, Randolph Hearst, and Meyer Rothschild, professional psychopaths that reach the pinnacle of the financial stage where they cause no less misery and destruction as their political counterparts. The professional psychopath is just as malevolent, narcissistic, and remorseless as the other stereotypes. They are just much smarter. They can be found in any profession, but usually governments, corporations, and religions will be thick with them. In a corporation, the professional psychopaths are ideally suited for advancement. They can masterfully fake their abilities and credentials, use their intellect and charm to manipulate and exploit others, and generally backstab their way to a high position. Once in power, their masks slip and they abuse their power and bully and sabotage their co-workers and subordinates. In politics, the professional psychopath's ruthlessness and cunning gives them a distinct advantage over any non-psychopath rival. They make charismatic leaders, manipulating and brainwashing the naive, vulnerable, uneducated, or mentally weak. Mastery of lying allows them to make whatever outrageous campaign promises straight-faced with, of course, no intention of keeping any of them. A life spent faking being human gives them the ability to assume the roles of virtuous public servant, the perfect father, husband, advisor, mentor, and every man. In addition, when things get rough, they have no inhibitions in playing dirty and readily resort to murder, assassination, persecution, war, and genocide. The third sphere of power that has traditionally attracted more than its fair share of psychopaths is religion. A quick glance at the history of religion, from the bloody sacrifices of the Aztec priests 
to the tortures of the Spanish Inquisitions and through seemingly endless religious wars waged in the name of peace and love makes their influence plainly visible to all willing to look. Since most, if not all, great religions are constructed on falsehoods, compulsive liars make the perfect proselytizers. I look at recently created religions such as Mormonism and Scientology show their founders, Joseph Smith and L. Ron Hubbard respectively, were at least compulsive liars and more likely full-blown psychopaths. Charismatic cult leaders such as Jim Jones and Sung Young Moon were indeed psychopaths, while televangelist preachers that rake in millions from their gullible flocks are at best con artists of the highest caliber. When psychopaths dominate and seize control of the major cultural institutions that influence a society, a final type of psychopath is created. Secondary Psychopaths While the classic genetic psychopath is one who is born with whatever genetic trait that causes this pathology, there is another group of people that behaves just like the classic psychopath who were not born that way but were created. Secondary psychopaths are created in two ways, through trauma and through groups. Trauma from an accident, drug addiction, or severe physical and psychological abuse can destroy that part of the frontal cortex of the brain where empathy and conscience is processed. While such individuals are a tragic reality in our society, they are in most cases just as incurable as their genetic counterparts are. The second way in which psychopaths are created is through groups. There are certain groups that will attract psychopaths because of the opportunities of power and influence membership provides. Usually such groups will quickly become led and dominated by psychopaths. Other non-psychopathic members of these groups would have to become psychopaths in order to survive. For example, in a street gang, sociopaths make the best leaders, and therefore most gangs have a sociopath at its head. Other psychopaths are also attracted to the violence and power of a street gang, and so together they create a psychopathic value system. The gang becomes a psychopathic entity. The non-psychopathic youth who must live within the territory of such a gang is given two choices, become a victim of the gang or join them. By joining the gang, the new recruit must also adopt the group's twisted value system and behave accordingly, thus becoming a secondary psychopath. Conversely, at the other end of the scale, we can see the same principle at work in corporations. The money and power of a corporation attracts the cerebral and narcissistic psychopaths. In a corporate environment, they have many advantages over their non-psychopathic competitors for promotion. Not surprisingly, most corporations end up being run by psychopaths. As with a criminal gang, a corporation's culture adopts the twisted values of its leaders those who would seek employment must likewise adopt, or at least appear to adopt, the corporation's essentially psychopathic mindset. What is important to understand is that a mob has no conscience. Individual members may or may not have a conscience, but when they are part of a mob, they will have none. Most organizations, from street gangs to corporations, are mobs. It would be a mistake to place your trust in them since they can turn predatory in a moment and deprive you of time, money, sanity, and livelihood. The Psychopath's Modus Operandi One weakness psychopaths have is that once one studies them and begins to understand them, they become predictable. While tactics vary from one to another, most psychopaths follow a similar strategy when conning either an individual or an organization. Their strategy is as follows. 
the interview. Psychopaths are experts at cold reading. First used by psychologists to describe what phony fortune tellers do, cold reading is the ability to guess a person's personality type quickly through verbal and nonverbal communication. The technique is simple. Ask questions and watch the responses. Psychopaths will cold read you as part of what is called the interview stage. The whole purpose of the interview is for the psychopath to size you up as a potential victim. They make mental notes of different ways they could possibly manipulate you. The Seduction Should you or your organization be seen as a suitable victim, the next stage is the seduction. Based on the results of their interview, the psychopath will tailor the seduction to your personality. If concerned about your appearance, they will flatter your good looks. If insecure about your education, they will flatter you about your intelligence. If greedy, they will have insider information on a get-rich-quick scheme. And if cowardly, then only the psychopath can protect you from your fears. On a personal level, they will shower you with praise and attention in a whirlwind romance. They make sure that being around them is fun and exciting, so that you become addicted to the adrenaline rush they create. On the organizational level, they pretend to be the perfect employee, the most devout follower, and the most dedicated public servant. They work to ingratiate themselves, first to the doorkeepers, and finally the power holders, often by being shameless sycophants and bootlickers. Divide and Conquer Just as a pride of lions will seek to separate a targeted wildebeest from the rest of the herd, so psychopaths seek to isolate their victims from the rest of humanity. They accomplish this through the tactic of divide and conquer. In a personal relationship, the psychopath will sabotage and undermine his or her victim's relationships with family and friends. Exasperated by the negative drama and costs associated with the victim, their friends and family drop out of contact, leaving the victim without the support and guidance of their social group. In an organizational setting, psychopaths are the consummate office politicians. They seek to create factions within the organization and then turn those factions against each other to create as much chaos as possible. Psychopaths swim in chaos, and the more, the better. Secretly, they start to draw the gullible, weak-minded, and fellow psychopaths to their side, while intensifying their efforts to have the most talented, honest, and incorruptible members, ones that could have the strength of character to expose them, expelled. They poison the environment in a variety of ways so that everyone feels irritable, edgy and unable to perform their jobs. Control of the organization slips into the hands of the source behind the dysfunction, the psychopath who created it all. Fear and Tyranny The final stage of the psychopath's strategy is tyranny, the absolute and sadistic control over his victims. In a relationship, the honeymoon is over and the mask comes off. The psychopath suddenly becomes controlling, abusive, and violent. Instead of flattery and attention, the tactics are now fear, intimidation, extortion, and emotional blackmail. On the organizational level, one sees benefits being cut while time cards and production quotas and surveillance increases. Employees become slaves, powerless and disposable cogs in a machine run for the sole benefit of the psychopaths in charge. On the national level, countries ruled by psychopaths become corrupt and brutish police states, constantly at war with created and imaginary enemies. The population becomes paranoid, neurotic, and ultimately secondary psychopaths. In a psychopathic culture, everyone must adopt a ruthless attitude as a survival strategy. Defense Against a Psychopath 
facing evil. One of the greatest advantages psychopaths have is that average decent people cannot believe that such monsters truly exist. This inability to comprehend the predator mentality is partly due to popular morality. All societies promote simplistic and idealistic morality through schools and churches that teach such platitudes as everyone has some good in them, everyone is special, and so forth. Such ideals more often serve as a cover behind which the true machinations of society can operate without evoking the suspicion of the mob. Another reason that people cannot face evil is fear. The true nature of psychopaths is the stuff of childhood nightmares. Many people simply cannot deal with the fear this realization causes, and so, to soothe their nerves, they revert to an infantile strategy of denial and magical thinking. If they do not acknowledge the existence of monsters, then the monsters cannot hurt them. The first line of defense against psychopaths is acknowledging their existence. By doing so, one develops a psychological advantage. Forewarned is forearmed, and having braced oneself with knowledge of predatory individuals, one is better able to think clearly and thus spot the predator before he can spot you. Once you accept the reality that human predators populate our society, the next line of defense is in identifying them. Because of their abilities at camouflage and deception, psychopaths are difficult to spot. They can fool even mental health professionals. It is important to understand that everyone can be conned. If you feel that you are the exception, you only make yourself more susceptible. Recognition A psychopath is like a smoking ember. The sooner you can spot the smoke and douse the ember, the better, since after the house is on fire, it is too late to contain the damage and destruction. Learn to spot the typical psychopathic character traits and recognize their modus operandi. Where possible, do background checks and or speak with the suspected psychopath's family and friends. Most psychopaths leave a long trail of destruction and heartbreak and will try to cover their tracks. A lack of background information is therefore as suspicious as a history of betrayals. Another of their fundamental flaws is a lack of patience and the incredible energy they use to maintain their facade. Over time, they drop their masks. Thus, one of the best methods of detecting psychopaths is to wait them out. Once you identify someone as being a psychopath, you have only two options, attack or evade. What not to do What is vital to understand is that empathy cannot defeat the psychopath. You cannot change them. You cannot reform them. You cannot find the goodness inside them. You cannot show them the way to God. And you cannot teach them about love. All these approaches are doomed to failure, since psychopaths can never understand, nor can they care about these concepts. While they may lead you to believe that you are getting through to them, in reality, your empathy infuriates them, and far from admiring your compassion, they despise you even more. One must develop a cold exterior to them and view them from a distance, do not pity them, feel sorry for them, or sympathize with them. Attack As a rule, the only thing that can defeat a psychopath is a bigger psychopath. However, should you feel no other recourse but to confront a psychopath, your one advantage is their fear of being exposed for what they are. They have known since childhood that they are different from most people. Their whole advantage lies in the fact that they know what they are and no one else does. Exposing a psychopath takes away his or her advantage and reveals their inner corruption for all to see. However, 
few people have the strength and intelligence to do this successfully. While the statistical distribution of genius and idiot psychopaths mirrors the general population, even a moronic psychopath can elude and outwit an educated accuser. Before you attempt to expose and expunge a psychopath, you must be in a position of power and you must choose the time and place. You also need to have your people briefed and ready to support you. This means creating a family and friends support group and or joining a support group. In an organizational setting, you need to have co-workers, managers, the legal department, and human resources on your side before making your move. The Chinese strategist Sun Tzu warned against attacking an enemy who has no escape, and likewise it is best not to corner a psychopath since the fight will likely be more vicious than most people can bear. Instead, use the threat of exposure to drive the psychopath away. The thought that they could be exposed at any time is unnerving, and most psychopaths will give up the current game and go in search of more ignorant and vulnerable prey. Evade A safer and easier strategy is to evade. Once you have identified someone as a psychopath, you must cut him or her off and out of your life completely. In a relationship, you may need to change your locks, change your phone numbers, and block your email account, close bank accounts, get a restraining order, or move. Take self-defense and firearms training. In conclusion, the study of psychopathy is an important new tool, not only in crime prevention, but in understanding the source behind many social ills. The more informed and aware you are of this subject, the safer you and your family will be.
been so long, dear, since we've been anywhere. I think we deserve. 